Okay, welcome everyone to our Facebook Live today. Uh, I'm really very excited. The topic is impact of COVID-19 on your heart. COVID-19 is not just a respiratory illness like we thought it was, because it definitely seems to affect the heart as well. So they say knowledge is power. So the more we know about it, we can take right steps to deal with this very real threat. So there's a lot of unknowns. That's why they call it a novel virus. There have been some pretty serious headlines like young and middle-aged people barely sick with COVID-19 are dying of strokes, et cetera. So it's, it's this very scary time that we're living in. So as I've said, it's empowering to be informed and I'm very excited to welcome my our guest today, a colleague and a good friend, Dr. McMacken, Craig McMacken, who is a cardiologist in Newtown. So we, I will be introducing him in just a bit. We will start with our grounding and centering exercise. And then I will tell you all about Dr. McMacken and you are in for a treat today because he's a real uh, wealth of knowledge, has a wealth of knowledge. And please feel free to ask as many questions as you all would like. So, um, so let's get started. Oh, I already see some people on the line. Welcome, welcome Cheryl. Um, welcome Amy Watts, Michaels. Welcome Amanda. Amanda says, she, oh, she works with you, uh, Craig. And uh, welcome Ellen. So we have a few people on already and I'm sure many more will join. So please tell us your name when you come on, those who haven't come on yet, and also uh, where you're from. That would be really very helpful. So I'd like to do a quick centering, grounding, and connecting uh, breathing exercise, and then we'll get, get into the topic for the day. So just please close your eyes and take three deep breaths, please. Inhale deeply. And exhale slowly. Inhale deeply again. And exhale slowly. Inhale deeply once more. And exhale slowly. Visualize a cord that extends from the top of your head, connecting you to your higher power, God or the universe. Visualize this cord running through your body, along your spine, and extending down into the ground, connecting you to Mother Nature and Mother Earth. Now visualize golden light pouring into every cell in your body, centering you and energizing you. Visualize holding hands as a group and inhale deeply once again. And exhale slowly and send out love and acceptance to every member of our group on this call and those who may be listening to the recording later. We have now created a supportive environment for all of us to learn from each other's questions and comments and experiences. We've also created a healing circle of healing and love that we're going to extend out to everybody in our family, all our family members, neighbors, people in our community, and extend those vibrations out to all the people in our cities, state, country, and worldwide. Take another deep breath, please. And exhale. And just visualize all the love and healing coming right back to us, helping us to cope with these very troubled times. And now you may all Open your eyes. Okay. So I'd like to introduce our guest here today, Dr. Craig McMacken. Dr. Craig McMacken is a cardiologist who practices in Newtown with Mercer Bucks Cardiology, and Newtown, Pennsylvania. And he's affiliated with St. Mary Medical Center and other hospitals in the area. He has been in practice for over 17 years. He graduated from Temple University School of Medicine Medical School 
He did his residency at Boston University Medical Center and Hospital and fellowships at Boston University Medical Center Hospital and Rhode Island Hospital as well. He's a friend and I have the greatest respect for Dr. McMacken and I am very excited to welcome you today. And uh, I know our uh, people on the call are waiting to learn some more about the impact of COVID-19 on the heart. So, so welcome, Dr. Vaiknath. Thank, Thank you. The uh, respect is mutual. Thank you so much for the invitation. This is, uh, I'm looking forward to it. Um, yeah, so maybe you can share a little bit about uh, what, the, what impact the, you know, COVID-19 may have on the heart. Certainly. Uh, so I think you know, a lot of us know a lot about this uh, this condition. Uh, as we were talking earlier, I think it's a unique type of uh, a condition where it's very new, but so much information has come around. I think a lot of people have a great deal of interest because it really impacts all of us. Uh, so a lot of us have learned a lot. Uh, hopefully, folks have learned from good you know good sources and and continue to do so uh, as as the situation evolves. Um, you're right; it's not just a respiratory illness, but uh, it is primarily that's where a lot of the uh, a lot of the serious illness comes in the way of uh, the respiratory illness, uh, a very severe inflammatory reaction from the viral uh, syndrome can occur um, and affect the uh, affect affect the breathing, uh, affect the whole body, and some of that overlaps with the heart certainly. Uh, I think you know a couple of big topics that people are concerned about are if they were to uh, contract the virus, uh, how would that affect them, uh, you know, the whole body, but also affect the heart, and and also the topic that I hear a lot from my patients is, uh, and a lot of my patients have heart conditions or risks for heart conditions, is what should they be doing? Uh, what can they do? Uh, and uh, it seems to be some, you know, increased amount of, of anxiety and worry among people who have heart conditions and other conditions that may uh, predispose them to have a more serious uh, syndrome with the virus. Um, I think one important message is that um, it's true that, that people who have heart uh, conditions can have a more serious impact on the virus, uh, but it doesn't make them more likely to get the virus as long as they are really following the precautions that all of us should be taking and being very vigilant about those precautions, all the things that we know about keeping our distance from others, about wearing our masks when we're uh, out in public, about being very, very vigilant about the hand washing or sanitizing. and. And I think this is, um, it seemed to me this whole situation has evolved, uh, you know, week by week. Every week there seems to be some new aspect or something new to consider. And I think where we are now is the recovery phase, as uh, we tend to call it uh, in, in, the, in the healthcare world. Uh, our offices and our hospitals are doing our best to, uh, you know, resume services and and uh, see patients for all the routine things that we need to see patients for outside of the, of the virus. Um, so. Uh, people who will have heart conditions and uh, other things that predispose them, lung conditions, emphysema and asthma, diabetes, you know, those are other conditions that people who have those uh, conditions are weary of. But continuing to be really, really vigilant, I think that's a really important message. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's tempting to get a bit more lax and uh, yeah. we do need to, to, to you know, relax uh, restrictions to some degree carefully and, and thoughtfully. Uh, but those who are uh, more predisposed to having a serious uh, issue should continue to be vigilant. Everybody's going to make their own decisions, but I think that's a really important message. Mm -hmm. um, the the think, impact, please. Just a quick thing. I think you made a really good point that it's not that having heart disease uh, necessarily means you're going to get the COVID-19. It's just that if you already have it and you get it, then you are more at risk for maybe other things going wrong. Am I correct in assuming correct. that? Yeah, correct. And that's that's why I mentioned just being, you know being vigilant. Of course, we all we all are. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, being extra vigilant if you have if you have that uh, you know something that uh, you know heart condition or diabetes, lung disease might predispose. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think the other topic then is, you know, what, what heart issues are we seeing in people who contract the virus and who come down with a more serious syndrome? And um, it falls into a few categories. One of the big uh, concerns that we see, and it's not common, but uh, when it happens, it's concerning is that people can get uh, a heart strain. They can get heart strain in the form of uh, what we call a cardiomyopathy, which is a weakening of the heart muscle. Uh, that can result in a condition called congestive heart failure, which is a 
a scary term. Uh, I always preface yeah. by saying that, and it, it varies in degree, uh, but it's a condition where the heart as a pump isn't functioning well and uh, that can have a tough time circulating blood to the body, uh, and that can go hand in hand with the cardiomyopathy. Uh, the other issue that we're seeing is people who are hospitalized and get blood work and an evaluation for uh, for the, the virus or concerns about the virus. We see blood tests that show strain on the heart. Uh, and that's an important note is is not necessarily mean a heart attack in the traditional sense. It, it, it's heart strain that we're seeing and uh, related to the overall stress that the virus puts on the body if it does uh, you know, result in a serious syndrome. Uh, from the body not getting enough oxygen, from the body not being able to pump blood well, and all the other uh, results that the virus can have. So those are the big effects on the heart, as well as some rhythm problems occasionally, uh, but not much different than we see you as far as uh, rhythm problems when people can, uh, you know, are sick with with other with other things that we're used to, whether it be pneumonia or other um, infections or situations where people end up quite, quite sick in a hospital. Mm -hmm. So you had mentioned when we were talking earlier about the troponin levels. So is that? Could you explain what those are? Maybe to understand and how. Sure, uh, sure. That, I mean, that's a blood. Yeah, it's the blood test I was referring to, and it's a blood test that we use very uh, routinely in, in healthcare and evaluating people who we are concerned might be having a heart attack, who are concerned might be having heart uh, injury or strain from other reasons. And troponin is simply one of the tools that we use to evaluate the situation. Uh, when a troponin is abnormal, that tells us that there's some strain on the heart. Uh, it's one of the factors that we use to diagnose a heart attack. Uh, it in and of itself doesn't diagnose a heart attack. It's got to be put in the, you know, in, in the context. Um, and we're seeing that people who have serious COVID-19 syndromes are uh, developing a troponin in their, in, in their blood work. And that's it's telling us that the heart's been damaged a bit uh, or strained a bit. Uh, just gives us another indicator of how serious the situation is and helps uh, guide uh, the treatments. Um, so uh, that's, that's, that's the value of the, of the troponin. Um, it is it is abnormal oftentimes when people do have a heart attack um, and it is important that when we're evaluating people who have this condition that we keep in mind that it, you know just because someone's sick and coming to the hospital and trouble breathing not everything is COVID these days we still need to remember and then and you know healthcare providers are very aware that we just still need to keep in mind all the other things that can happen in typical times and make sure that we uh, you know are treating people uh, treating people appropriate for for anything that can uh, uh, can come upon them. Mm -hmm. You know, people are really very afraid these days to even go to the ER uh, because they're afraid they're going to get COVID if they go there. And uh, my fear for, I know for my own patients too, is that God forbid they have some symptoms, are they taking care of that? Are you seeing that level of fear in your practice too? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I think um, uh, everybody's got, you know, got, got concerns that they, they haven't had in normal times. And, and certainly that is, I think, a uh, a worry and a concern. Uh, I, I do feel very strongly that the hospitals are doing a tremendous job of protecting everyone that comes through their doors, protecting the employees, protecting patients who are coming now for routine visits, patients who are coming in sick to the emergency room. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of information has been shared very quickly about how to uh, manage the situation, uh, making sure that people who need to come to the hospital for, for any reason are, are protected as much as possible from being exposed to the virus. And so it is very important to emphasize and, and, and thank you for mentioning because it it's very important that people, if they're not feeling well, if they think that they are having trouble, whatever the reason, you know, do come to the hospital and get the care that they would normally get and, and trust that the hospitals are going to, you know, do a very, very good job of protecting them from exposure. Uh, yeah, very, very important question. And, and, and as we talked about before, I, I hope that folks are you know, sending questions in along to you. I, I very much enjoy the question and answer format. So anybody that's watching, I, I please invite you to, to ask your questions because I much enjoy uh, making sure people get answers to the questions that are on their mind. Yeah. Yes. And I second Dr. McMacken. Please, everybody, whoever's on, on here, please ask uh, Dr. McMacken all the questions. I know that I know everyone has some question or the other. <laughs> I know I've had a couple of my own. So. Please do that. Um, Dr. McMacken, another question that has come up for me uh, with patients also is about getting uh, the necessary testing done. So can you speak to that? Because people are scared to go to the labs and get tested for uh, you know, cholesterol and blood work and all that. 
Uh, so can you speak a little bit to that? Sure, sure absolutely. Yeah, I thought you were going to speak to that, that there's also testing for, for the virus itself that we can talk about. But yeah, um, yeah, yeah testing, and I, that goes along with what I was saying about uh, yeah. you know getting getting care for your routine medical needs. Uh, certainly a lot has been put on hold appropriately and finding different manners of getting uh, you know, getting care to people. Uh, telehealth is something that's it been a, a very, very big sea change and I think a very interesting topic uh, mm -hmm. to see how the, uh, you know, certainly our country and I presume the world is really evolved to embracing telehealth uh, out of necessity, but we're all seeing the value in it. So um, certainly, so so getting the blood work, getting getting testing that's needed, uh, from what I've seen, uh, and my patients have uh, conveyed to me, they feel very safe in the lab in general. I think uh, some people who've, who have routine blood work that, you know, can be postponed for a month or two or three at this point, uh, you know, maybe reasonable, uh, certainly always contacting your doctor. If you've got any concerns about how urgent uh, testing is, whether it be blood work or, or uh, you know, x-rays or whatever it may be, you know, please, please contact your doctor uh, provider and let them know that you've got some concerns and, and your provider can help you navigate so the best way to go about it. But from what I've seen, my patients have told me they feel very comfortable going to the lab that, um, uh, that they're feeling very safe, that they're doing like a lot of us are doing is, you know, one at a time, keeping distance and, and changing workflow so that, uh, so that people are safe. Certainly. Thank you. That, that was uh, really very helpful. I think Cheryl Pinto has uh, has a question here. Right. Is it true that COVID-19 enhances thrombosis? So yeah, it certainly does seem so. Uh, I would say in the uh, it seems that in the in the sickest patients, so you know those patients typically that are that are quite sick that are in the intensive care units, uh, we are seeing uh, thrombosis, which is blood clotting, uh, mm -hmm. and, and then what develops can be uh, it's called a DVT or deep venous thrombosis, and then PE or pulmonary embolism. So blood clots typically form in the leg and veins and then can get dislodged and float to the lungs uh, and cause additional problems. And certainly a well-observed uh, situation, a lot of the discussion still ongoing about what's the best way to be proactive. Most folks who are hospitalized, especially in an intensive care unit, are getting uh, a blood thinning medication to be uh, preventative and then, and then treatment uh, you know, accordingly if patients do develop those conditions. Uh, but again, it's been very impressive how the world has shared medical knowledge and very, very quickly uh, trying to figure out the best ways and it can change you know week to week if not day to day so i would also say trust that especially the intensive care unit docs uh the intensivists and their teams uh know the best uh if, if that were to, to to occur thank you so much uh there's diane doherty uh, de marcello says are the cardiac symptoms you see due to the virus reversible over time or permanent so great question, and like a lot of questions that we're wondering, how's this gonna how's this gonna evolve over time, and how much permanence is there uh, from the conditions that we're seeing to the you know the antibodies that develop, and a lot of these questions we just don't know yet. We just don't know yet about whether things the permanence of these things based on how other viruses have reacted. This uh, the heart damage that I referred to before, cardiomyopathy or a viral cardiomyopathy, is a condition that we see, and it can be certainly reversible. There's there's situations where where with the right medications, a lot of these patients who develop a cardiomyopathy because of a virus is reversible. You know whether that's going to be the case with this virus or not. It's it's you know impossible to know. Uh, but uh, you know we can be optimistic that if if this virus acts like others, uh, in, in you know in, in many ways it is reversible. Uh, but this virus obviously has acted in ways that that weren't expected. Also, so it's tough to know. Yeah, Lori, thank you for, for that answer, Lori. Uh, Puskar, I think, um, says, when will your office resume stress testing? So uh, I'll answer that, you know, in, in, a, in a bigger way. I think that, that it would, you know, be of interest to a lot. To, you know, what are we doing about testing? What's what's the uh, you know, healthcare doing about testing, and how are we uh, reinstituting that? So uh, carefully is the answer. I think mm -hmm. across the board, procedures, testing, surgeries, very, very, very big topic. Uh, I was involved with uh, helping uh, our local hospital, St. Mary, kind of figure some of that out from the cardiology standpoint, and and a huge teams of many people, administrators and clinicians, trying to figure out the safest way to do that. Uh, right. Right now, stress testing in particular, we're not doing any exercise testing, which has been the guidance from our, our national societies. Uh, we don't want people in offices huffing and puffing and breathing heavy uh, doing the exercise mm -hmm. testing. So right now, it's it's what we call pharmacologic testing, uh, 
uh, which is nuclear stress testing mainly, uh, echocardiograms, vascular studies, things that don't, don't involve exercise, we're, we're reinitiating, uh, I think similar to a lot of practices and similar to a lot of diagnostic testing that's going on all over, you know, x-rays and MRIs and CT scans. I think a lot of things are being uh, resumed, uh, but with the appropriate precautions. Again, any questions, call the office, you know, I mean, not just mine, but, you know, wherever, wherever your, your, your providers practice and, and ask them because everybody's figuring out, uh, you know, as we go along. Yeah. Thank you for that, because I've been, uh, people ask me that question, too. I wonder when we can get the stress testing done and, you know, and I always, of course, refer them back to your office. Uh, for Mary uh, Harlan Albert says, is borderline high blood pressure a risk factor for a poor outcome from COVID? So, so not that I know of as far as borderline high blood pressure. I think some heart conditions and, and other medical conditions, as I kind of listed before, but heart disease, specifically coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, uh, cardiomyopathies, certainly congenital heart disease, those things that are more uh, more established in chronic uh, heart conditions. Uh, I've certainly you know, seen some uh, reports of high blood pressure, but everything's a matter of degree. So, uh, and, and it also brings up a point that Dr. Ryan, uh, Rao and I talked about earlier. Uh, the better controlled your chronic medical condition uh, is to begin with, uh, the more likely you'll be able to have better reserve for dealing with whether it be a, a, you know, COVID-19 infection or any other uh, infection or, or, or stress that's put on the body. And so you know, I think just really emphasizes the point that if you do have a medical condition, that even though these times are are, are, are hard and, and uh, access to medical care can be a challenge, uh, making sure you're proactive about being healthy, living healthy, uh, staying uh, staying active. Uh, nutrition was a topic that uh, has been on your uh, been on been on your show before, and um, making sure you have medications available and staying in touch with your providers and making sure your your chronic conditions are are well managed uh, is always important, but particularly important now, especially for those concerned about the risk of of uh, you know, getting the virus and having more trouble. Um, but but borderline high blood pressure along with borderline uh, other conditions I don't I don't think we know enough to be able to tease that out uh, uh, statistically but uh, still important to take care of ourselves. Thank you for that and what I've also been really trying to drive home with people is managing stress and anxiety which is at a heightened rate right now and I, and I know that that affects the blood pressure levels as well. So we've been you know trying to really drive that point home to man, you know to keep your stress levels down to keep the blood pressure down as well so yeah and whatever and and i would say you know people who are able to uh know that they're doing what they can to control their their medical conditions and, and that sense of control i think is really really important right mm -hmm. having that sense of control uh knowing that you're doing what you can to keep yourself healthy uh, is really important for the for, for the for the stress levels our emotional well-being and our physical well-being also Thank you. What, that was an excellent point because loss of control is the number one thing they say where people's anxiety levels go up as a result. And then it's a, you know, it's a cascading effect. Everything else starts to go, go wrong when you have that high level of uh, um, cortisol and adrenaline in your, uh, in your body as right. a result of high stress levels. And I think that's going to be, you know, very important now as we recover mm -hmm. from this is we all need to make our own decisions about how we're going to, uh, you know, reintroduce ourselves into our, our, our you know, prior routines and, and see people again and see family again and, uh, you know, making decisions that we feel are wise for us uh, and to have that control about these decisions, uh, I think is it's going to be important and going to be helpful. Yeah. Thank you again. Um, so Cheryl asks here, will aspirin a day help? So I don't think we can we can advise that everybody take an aspirin a day. I mean, aspirin, you know, a lot of people may think of that as a, as a, uh, you know, a harmless uh, addition to, to our medication list. But certainly there's no recommendations to have uh, kind of uh, uniformly people take an aspirin. Uh, if someone has risks for a heart attack or stroke or if they've had those conditions before, having that conversation with their provider uh, on, a, on a, you know, individual basis is important, uh, you know, just like it was in the, in the pre-COVID time. It was a big topic, actually, that, that was discussed recently before this about an aspirin a day or not and, and for what populations, but not across the board. 
Can it also cause GI issues? I'd read that it was controversial with the aspirin a day thing because it's causing GI issues. Yeah, aspirin, that's the big topic if we're, you know, uh, you know, off the COVID-19 topic just for a moment was, yeah, that was the uh, big trial that was looking at uh, older adults taking aspirin a day or not and the absence of heart disease, was it beneficial? Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't found to be beneficial again in, in, in older adults without heart disease. Uh, and so, uh, but though, again, that was one one trial in one particular population answering one specific question and so we always need to be careful about not uh, overextending uh, in the results of one trial or, 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 or one uh, uh, one investigation to, uh, to the population. Thank you. Um, so Nancy uh, LaJoy says, I was very impressed with my lab at the hospital upon having blood work last month. When you enter the hospital you are stopped immediately and questioned and given their mask uh, to keep on. So I guess she's commenting on it and perhaps also, uh, I think you have spoken to that, that our hospital is also doing the same thing, right? St. Mary here. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. And I think we, we, these are important points to share with one another as we all get out there and have different experiences. And uh, particularly when we have reassuring experiences to let people know that, uh, that, that, that they're feeling good about going out and, and, and doing the things that, that need to be done. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, Honestly, I, I, I feel quite safe going to the hospital. It is impressive, the, the amount of work and uh, the, the staff that's been redeployed to be at all the doors, uh, you know, coming in and going out. And, and uh, in addition to making sure we're safe, being a reassuring smiling face is really important too. It really, really feels like a team effort uh, at the hospital and, and, uh, and elsewhere in healthcare. It's been impressive. Thank you. Uh, so Amy Watts has a question. Is it possible that patients who have had COVID-19 could develop scarring of heart valves later on from the inflammatory process of this disease, such as rheumatic fever uh, can cause scarring of the heart valves? Oh, that's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Um you know, uh, certainly, like, like I said before, of course, you know, tough to say what's going to be down the, you know, down the road with the long-term effects. Uh, but I, I will say that rheumatic fever is a very, very unique and uh, condition, and rheumatic valvular disease is a very, very unique condition. It's it's something that we see uh, less and less of as as uh, you know. Uh, since rheumatic fever is a, is a condition that we're not seeing you know, nearly as much of in, in, in current times. Uh, but people who have rheumatic valve disease are those who've had rheumatic fever in the past and a small fraction of those had inflammation and thickening of their valves and valve dysfunction. But it's a very unique condition for the valves. I mean, there's heart valve problems that happen for a variety of other reasons. Uh, but I don't, I don't know there's any reason to suspect that COVID-19 would cause a similar syndrome to uh, rheumatic uh, fever causing rheumatic valve disease. Uh, again, we never know, but uh, it's really a pretty unique condition that way. Thank you. Uh, so Nancy Joy says, being on a blood thinner and eliquis al already helps if you do have blood clots from COVID. Can it help, I guess she's asking. Can it help? Yeah. So again, an important point is that a lot of these very, very worrisome things happen uh, mm -hmm. largely <laughs> the people that are that are most sick with the condition. And again, you know, in the intensive care, and certainly hospitalized uh, or, you know, largely in intensive care. In other words, if, if an individual has COVID that they are able to stay at home and not need to be in the hospital and need to, you know, weather the illness uh, and, and, and manage their symptoms at home, that's not the population that we're seeing uh, these blood clots primarily. Um, so again, rest assured, if you're in the hospital, uh, that's going to be uh, a consideration uh, and you're going to be treated appropriately. So uh, people who are on Eliquis that, you know, the, the docs caring and the team caring for uh, patients in the hospital may decide to continue that versus a different blood thinner. It really depends on the individual circumstance and individual person's condition. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think there are any more questions yet, but you know, if people have any more questions, this is your chance to ask them. So I have a question about telehealth, Dr. McMacken. So are you, you're doing telehealth, right? Can you speak to that, telehealth? Yes, absolutely. Yes, our practice is doing telehealth. A lot of practices have uh, have transitioned to telehealth as a big part of their practice. Certainly, uh, at the onset of this, I think, uh, like I had mentioned before, it's a big learning curve in a lot of ways on a lot of aspects of this for healthcare and for society. 
Uh, but I think the telehealth story is a very interesting one. I think you know, we were fortunate. Uh, we're part of the Jefferson Health System, and they have a very robust uh, telehealth platform that it was already uh, it was already in existence. And so mm-hmm. we were able to utilize that uh, and many other practices. There's many you know telehealth platforms out there, uh, and I think fortunately it was very quickly adopted by uh, the healthcare uh, you know, industry and providers. And then I think reasonably quickly adopted by society and by people that once uh, just about everybody who I have uh, seen or certainly you know friends and family who have done it personally have had a nice experience and been surprised and I, I think it's important to, to emphasize that especially because as we recover uh, it's still going to be an important piece uh, getting people back in the office for visits uh, we and I suspect you know all others are doing it carefully and and differently than we had been before uh you know less uh, you know less folks who are going to be able to get through the office because of all the uh uh you know kind of a ca- um precautions required so telehealth is still important and uh, back to my point about taking care of yourself getting the care that you need being proactive about that and i think telehealth is something that i encourage people to be accepting of and and being accepting of it as an option and Give it a try, right? <laughs> like a lot of other people, you don't know until you try it. And I think you'll see if you try it, it is really is value in it. Uh, and if there's something that is missing from a telehealth visit that's really needed in you know the cardiology world, you know an EKG and a physical exam are the two obvious uh, examples. Uh, if it's felt that that is really needed, then we you know make a plan to come into the office uh, selectively and, and get those things accomplished. Uh, but don't uh, yeah don't don't shy away from telehealth if you if you haven't given it a try because I think you may find a lot of value not only now but going forward. I think we're all going to see it as a tool that we can use to get care to the people that need it and might have less ability to get into the office. Mm-hmm. So uh, I have a question about uh, telehealth. Would you recommend that people have those who are at high risk for uh, cardiac problems or those who already have heart problems? Would you recommend those uh, uh, devices that I see advertised? I know some of my patients already have it. Those who have AFib uh, also have it. It's it's a little device to take your EKG that shows you if you're an AFib or not. Would yep. you recommend something like that if, for the telehealth uh, uh, visit? So I, uh, it depends on a person's situation. Those are, have been very helpful devices, no doubt. Uh, you know, no different than people, frankly, taking their blood pressure at home or, or monitoring a lot of things that are, you know, more traditionally people are able to monitor uh, at home. Uh, it, this is, you know, a little more high tech, but, uh, yeah. certainly has been a great tool for a lot of people. I, I would certainly say to individualize it. I don't think that we need to, uh, advise that everybody, you know, get one of these devices just so that they can kind of check their own kind of, you know, Check, it's, it's to check your heart rhythm is, is what it's utilized for. And may, you know, mainly in two situations, I would say, mostly in people who have a history of a heart rhythm problem right. and want a tool to monitor to see if there's a recurrence. Uh, and then the people who potentially have intermittent symptoms and want to use it as a tool to figure out what might be going on. Uh, and since symptoms are intermittent, sometimes it's tough to you know establish a diagnosis if there's not a monitor at hand. And then so for that reason, it can be helpful. But uh, certainly, I think now no different than any other time. If you think that might be a helpful device, check with your uh, check with your provider, ask them what they think um, and then take it from there. But uh, uh, not 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 needed for everybody. Not for everybody. Okay. The the other device also that uh, I was thinking about that some people have been mentioning is the oximeter. I think that if I'm pronouncing correctly. So uh, because that seems to be a big indicator for COVID as well, right? When the blood flow, when the blood oxygen levels drop. Can you speak to that a little bit? So, uh, in my opinion, I, I, I again, I, I wouldn't advise really that it be, a, be a, any sort of uniform recommendation to, to get these devices. I think that, uh, and I really don't think it should be used to uh, be a, a screening tool for an individual for uh, low oxygen levels. I certainly haven't seen that, you know, in any of the uh, in any of the, the kind of national guidelines. Uh, speaking to that, so the CDC website is terrific. You know, a lot of these questions uh, are addressed there. Uh, but it's the basics that we should be looking out for and be aware of. And that's uh, actually another important point for folks who have heart condition or other conditions that may predispose them to 
being more ill is to, to you know, be aware of your symptoms. I mean, maybe it's a simple point, uh, but really be uh, well informed about what COVID-19 symptoms are uh, with the cough, with the fever, uh, mm-hmm. with the shortness of breath. And those are really the things that should drive somebody going to be evaluated, uh, mm-hmm. that should, you know, initiate an evaluation. Mm-hmm. Um, not the uh, not not the low auction level necessarily. I, I, I'm partly concerned about you know giving any sort of you know universal recommendation because the auction can be you know low for a lot of other reasons. Auction can be low because it's not being checked correctly. You know, uh, mm-hmm. simple things like having you know dark nail polish on or things like that. That mm-hmm. if it's if it's a tool that's not used in the appropriate setting, I think it can potentially cause a lot more worry than uh, than, than, than be a reliable answer. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for that clarification because so many people have been saying to me, oh, you know, I think I'm going to go get an oximeter, uh, you know, that's going to tell me if I'm in danger. And, you know, so there's a little bit of hype around that because I guess you hear people saying that on TV or or whatever, wherever they're getting that information. So thank you for that very good clarification. Yeah, to to that point, yeah, make sure that you're getting information. If you hear things out, there's so many places to get information nowadays that, you know, there's, there's many that aren't necessarily. The, the most accurate or the the most helpful. So you know, go to those websites, the CDC and and other you know uh, reputable websites to, to to get answers to those questions. Yeah, thank you. You're so Diane Doherty Di Marcello says, in the future, will telehealth visits take the place of routine yearly office visits, or is it important to still get a yearly EKG, etc.? Sure. Uh, I don't. I personally don't think telehealth is going to take the place of those uh, routine visits. Uh, I mean, me personally, there's 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 uh, nothing that takes the place of uh, you know a face to face interaction. Uh, there's a lot of value uh, there. A lot of you know annual visits. Also, the physical exam is an important piece. Uh, you know, to have, having the, your provider take a listen. The yearly EKG. Uh, and that's that's really individual. I don't know that everybody needs an EKG every year. Uh, you know, at uh, even at our at a cardiology office, you know, some folks come you know every three, six, twelve months. It depends on the situation, and then it's really a, a judgment call by your provider about how often to get an EKG. Uh, so, not for the EKG specifically, but just in general, uh, a yearly visit I think is still going to be valuable. I think telehealth, you know, it's still it's going to find its place. Uh, you know, where I see it happening is, you know, people who are, uh, you know, not able to get to the office for one reason or another, uh, mobility or distance, or uh, frankly, they're not feeling well and you need a more immediate evaluation. And, and so from the provider end also, if they, there may not be an, an office visit, but it may find its place for a, you know, a quick conversation that uh, is uh, yeah, a little more value than, than, a, than a phone call per se. So, you know, to be determined, but I don't, I don't think it's going to take the place of, of those in-person visits entirely, not, not by any means. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, Cheryl Pinto says, will it be necessary for those that have been exposed to COVID-19 either with overt or a subclinical infection, would they have to take a vaccine? So, yeah, I think um, if I can take that as an opportunity just to talk a little more broadly, um, I mean, the vaccine, we don't, you know, we're, we're all waiting to see. We're all waiting to see. That, that question I certainly can't answer, and I don't think anybody can right now. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the issue is, I think the bigger issue is in people who have had uh, the infection uh, and they have antibodies, are they going to be protected going forward? You know, a really, really important question that has yet to be answered. Um, Historically, uh, I mean, just to give a real brief about you know what it means that what a, what a vaccine is, right, and how does it work? Uh, vaccine is uh, a, a purposeful uh, introduction of some sort of uh, a virus, often or some other uh, you know disease causing uh, problem that when you get a vaccine, the body then develops antibodies uh, so that it recognizes that uh, virus. And then so if you were to get exposed to uh, the live virus, the flu, of course, an example, uh, your body would then be able to fight that off quickly because you already are prepared, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, that's why this vaccine is so important for this uh, virus, just like so many others, that you can then have a society that's prepared to fight off this uh, virus if if a person were exposed. Um, you know, oftentimes if people have uh, been exposed to something, then they will have immunity, you know, so getting an infection often will 
looking for immunity uh, down the road. Uh, but we just don't know. Uh, you know, the flu, for example, you can have flu one year and then you need a vaccine the next year because it changes a bit. You know, yeah. the flu virus yeah. changes, uh, you know, each year. We try to be, uh, we, we try to figure it out. We try to, you know, we try to get ahead of it, try to figure out what, what type of flu is going to be around the world each particular year and get people vaccinated. But it's by no means perfect. And so we still have a lot to learn about, about this virus. Uh, but, you know, rest assured, a lot of work's being done. Yeah. It could easily be mutating, right? And then we'll need a whole different vaccine. I mean, a whole different uh, shot for that. Right, so, right, right. Um, so the testing, maybe I could speak to that for a moment. Yeah, I, yeah, so I can ask you yeah. that. Yeah. And kind of come up before, I think, you know, very, very hot topic. Yeah. Um, two basic types of testing that are being, uh, that, that, that are worth discussing are testing for the virus, uh, mm -hmm. uh, trying to evaluate if somebody has an active infection, and then testing for antibodies. Mm -hmm. So I think the testing that we've been talking mostly about, especially early on in uh, the pandemic, is testing for the virus. So these are the nasal swabs uh, mm -hmm. that then are evaluated with a, uh, what's called a PCR, or polymerase chain reaction, which basically magnifies or tries to magnify the signal of the virus so that it can be detected and then if you can if the virus can be detected then the, it can be pretty uh, convincingly uh, concluded that a person has the virus uh, mm -hmm. there are uh, concerns about uh, largely about what's called false negatives there are also uh, false positives these are both statistical terms but false negative uh, as uh, the name applies the test is negative, meaning the test says you don't have it, but it's, mm -hmm. it's false, it's wrong. You know, a person can have the uh, virus, but have a negative test, and that's a false negative. And there's a fair amount of that happening uh, for a variety of reasons, whether it be the technique of getting the swab, whether it be too early in the amount of virus in a person that it uh, can't yet be detected, uh, or other reasons. And so that's why, and that's well recognized. And there's, uh, there's approaches to that, which often involves checking a second swab. If there is a strong suspicion that the person has the virus, you know, we don't stop at one negative test anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and for a while now, we've recognized this. And so we'll test again if we're suspicious somebody has the virus. And so that's the testing that really has ramped up quite substantially and uh, is now, you know, quite available still, you know, uh, still could use more and we're, you know, the, the, you know, everybody's working on it, uh, but that's the uh, testing for the virus. And then there's the antibody testing that uh, I would say still is uh, certainly uh, more in development and still trying to figure out not only how to best test for the antibodies, uh, but then certainly the next step of if someone does have antibodies, what does that mean for their long-term protection? Uh, and that we don't know yet. That we know, hopeful, but we don't, we don't know yet. So does St. Mary do the testing there or are there locations close by or? So, so a variety, yeah, so St. Mary, just about probably like, uh, like most hospitals, has a, a variety of tests available. There are tests that, uh, different techniques of doing them, different turnaround times, so to speak, about getting the results. Initially, uh, as we might remember, there was a lot of uh, concern about not only the tests not being available, but it taking many days to a week or more to get the results, uh, which is very challenging. For a lot of reasons nowadays, there uh, are pretty good turnarounds. Some some are done, you know, within uh, 24, 48 hours. Others are done much quicker, even an hour or so. Uh, and and hospitals are figuring out how to utilize these different tests uh, and their different characteristics to to uh, to get the work done. So. For example, someone needs a procedure and is a scheduled procedure. Uh, most everybody, I would, I would presume, most places who's getting a procedure is getting a test beforehand to, so that we know whether or not they have the virus so that we can appropriately decide whether they should still have the procedure uh, and if they absolutely need it and even if they're positive, take the appropriate precautions. Uh, but certainly very clear, uh, very clear um, protocols have been put into place about all of that. But yes, St. Mary has a plethora of, of tests and, and using them to, to safely uh, get people the care that they need. So do they have the antibody tests as well as the, the actual 
COVID tests? So uh, to be honest, I don't know as much about the availability of where that is with the antibodies because it's still it's still kind of in the, in the test phase. Um, and it's certainly not anything that's out there for uh, public consumption uh, kind of more universally than I'm aware of. I mean, there's there's trials going on. There's um, part of certain circumstances where, where antibody testing is being done. Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure what the what the very most up to date is. So I just want to hold off on <laughs> given any more <laughs> since I'm not quite sure. What is your opinion on the fact that if somebody's already had the virus, can they contract it again? Or uh, or is that another thing that we're not really 100% sure about? <laughs> Put me on the spot. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I really do have to give that. Uh, we're not really sure yet answer. I mean, that's the only that's the only uh, responsible answer to give. I say, you know, that we're that we're optimistic. Right. And if, if this virus behaves like others, that tends to be the case. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, we're all being very cautious because this has been a you know more troublesome virus than, than many others. So we got to be real careful before we you know, make that presumption. And, you know, so. Importantly, uh, if somebody has had the virus, they should still be doing everything like the rest of us, right? Yeah. Wearing their masks and then washing their hands. I mean, not only because it's the right thing to do, but you know, I would, uh, you know, I, I would be upset to see people out there not wearing masks or not doing these things, uh, you know, thinking that they're invincible. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't convey a good message to society because if people are out there not uh, following uh, the rules that the rest of us are, I think that's. You know, it's not good for the rest of us. It's not good for the morale and, and, and society to, to see that. So we don't know. And we should all be being very vigilant about all the precautions that, uh, that are advised to all of us. Thank you. So Mary uh, Albert says, please speak about the way that COVID affects children. The Kawasaki-like syndrome is frightening, especially when we thought at first that they weren't likely to get it. Yes. Uh, yeah, this is a tough one. Uh, it is. Yeah, it is an upsetting uh, development in this virus, in this pandemic. Uh, so the Kawasaki disease is a uh, inflammatory condition of a largely vascular condition that uh, this uh, syndrome seems to uh, mimic um, or this you know, that the virus is seeming to mimic this Kawasaki syndrome. Uh, and it first uh, took a little bit of time to, to recognize it because uh, a number of children who first came down with the syndrome were not test, were testing negative for COVID. Uh, but then upon retest, like we talked about before, were, were coming up positive. And, and I believe even some of the syndrome who weren't, you know, were tested a number of times and we're, we're still coming up negative, but I think now there's pretty convincing evidence that there's some relationship, uh, but a relatively new development and still a lot to be learned about it. Um, as far as, you know, uh, treatment of it and what exactly is going on, but I, I would, you know, presume it has something to do with the underlying process that this virus causes, which is a very systemic inflammatory uh, situation uh, that is, seems to be the reason for the severe respiratory issues that some people have, the, the prothrombotic or the blood clotting issues. And now, you know, seeing another part of uh, or variety of the syndrome, they presumably all related to the inflammation. You know, what to do about that? I would say right now, making sure we keep our kids safe, you know, making sure that we do what we've been advised about keeping distance and, and keeping cautious. And, and, you know, I think like many things, prevention here is the, the very, very most important approach. Thank you. Thank you again for that. That's, that's a very frightening thing for a lot of, uh, you know, parents of young children. Yeah, so, right. yeah. With reference to that, Dr. McMacken, I know I, we had talked a little bit about that and people might want to know, you know, I've, I've heard this new term, I'd never heard it before, which is the cytokine storm. Now, is that what's going on with this Kawasaki-like syndrome in kids? Or can you speak to that, like what that even means and, what, you know? Sure, yeah. So cytokines are, uh, are, 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 are um, uh, little molecules, essentially, that our body uses to communicate and communicates inflammation, part of our immune system, a big part of our immune system uh, that we that we rely on uh, for our immune system to do its work. Uh, but the cytokine storm, uh, as the name implies, is when things get out of control. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was pretty well recognized early on that 
that seems to be a big part of what is happening in the people that get the sickest with this condition. Those that have the breathing trouble, that have the low oxygen, that have uh, what uh, you know what, what is causing all the trouble with the lungs and requiring the uh, the support of the the ventilators. So it's that cytokine storm that it seems to be a big part of it. And that recognition, I think, was helpful for uh, helpful for us to try to diagnose when somebody was potentially getting into trouble. And so to, to recognize that type of syndrome to then, uh, you know, you really be proactive about about getting the aggressive treatment that people need. Uh, so, you know, recognized by, you know, most of the time it's an intensive care unit doctor, an infectious disease uh, doctor that are uh, managing those situations and, you know, doing their best. To, and there's a lot of other markers too. So when people have uh, a, you know, a serious COVID uh, infection, there's a lot of other markers too, blood work, uh, mm -hmm. you know, chest x-ray, CAT scans in the chest, mm -hmm. but a number of other blood markers too that can be uh, checked and, and to get an idea of how serious the situation is and be proactive. Yeah. Thank you so much because that was just a new term that's been floating around. So yeah, I think yeah. <laughs> very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. So question uh, Baba at no Belsa says, thank you, Dr. Rao, for providing the communication platform and Dr. Mac Mac and for sharing your time and expertise. So they're thanking us. Yeah. Thank you for showing up on the program today. We, we're really happy you did that. Um, let's see if there are any other questions. I'm just checking here. Let me see if there's anything else that I had yeah. thought to talk about. Um, yeah. Just looking through, I just wrote written. I just wrote some notes down about. Um, I think we've talked about a lot. Um, yeah, I think we've covered quite a bit. Yeah, I think you know, just just recapping. I think a lot of uh, you know a lot of things about reducing risk. That was my kind of last note. I think on my. Uh, on uh, uh, you know things to things to discuss, or you know just reminders about all of us having that control, like we had talked about before, to to make sure we're being vigilant about reducing our risk. Um, uh, you know, making sure that we have enough of our medications on hand, making sure that we're, you know, get, getting our questions answered. And, and uh, it kind of it back to that telehealth point a little bit, I, I want to encourage people to not uh, to not um, be reluctant about reaching out to their providers if they have questions, whether it be about COVID or, or you know, uh, also very importantly, any health condition or question that they have, because frankly, I suspect that a lot of uh, offices have some availability now. A lot of times it can be, you know, difficult to get through to, uh, to uh, you know, to, 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 the, to, to one's uh, doctor's office. And that's always kind of a, a challenging thing, be a frustrating thing. But I suspect that, uh, you know, I know our practice and I suspect, you know, hospitals and practices are making an effort to make sure that people can to get through and, and, and get, get questions answered. And, and now with the telehealth can, you know, get appointments. So you know, don't be shy about calling your doctor if you have a question or have a concern. Don't put it off, is my point. You know, don't put it off. Make sure that you're taking care of yourself. I really think that that's one of the best ways that we can uh, can be uh, uh, be proactive about it, preventing us from, from getting this and, and preventing us from getting sick any other way or get running into trouble with our the other, the other uh, health issues that we need to take care of. So thank you, Dr. McMack. And just a quick question about dental health. A lot of people are putting off having, you know, dental cleanings or even taking care of uh, infected teeth, et cetera. Um, and I know that that, I think I, I've heard that that can, if there's an infection, that can affect your heart. Is that correct? Or uh, can you speak to that? So sure, yeah. I mean, two, two related topics. I think the, the first about what to do about you know postponing routine dental work. It's uh, that's a challenging one because I uh, you know all through this uh, most procedures, uh, surgeries, testing was really postponed. Everything that wasn't an emergency, uh, but you know procedures and surgeries don't just fall into two categories. You know, emergency and everything else. There's a, there's a spectrum, uh, and so you know the, the the dental issue I think is an important one and a dilemma. You know, there's a spectrum of from routine cleanings to you know concern about a dental infection, and that can be serious. That uh, I think uh, you know certainly a dental infection can not only you know not just to the heart, but a dental infection can lead to a bloodstream infection. You know, potentially in very serious uh, you know circumstances. But I think there's also and then again 
outside of the COVID conversation, a, a, a connection between dental health, oral hygiene, and heart and vascular health, I think, mm -hmm. because of a, a lot of the, the kind of an inflammatory hypothesis, shall we say, separate from the whole cytokine storm and inflammation condition with COVID, but you know, yeah. inflammation is is a, is a is a I think a very hot topic in, in in healthcare these days, and has been you know felt to be an underlying cause for a lot of uh, different conditions. But um, certainly, there's some folks who who uh, feel very strongly about dental health and the connection to systemic you know, systemic health, and I think there's something to that certainly. Uh, but what to do about the dental care is tricky. Uh, I'm not as up to date on where where the uh, uh, the dental world is on uh, on that, but certainly, again, if you have a question, you know, call your dentist, call your uh, you know, call your provider, and, and ask them where they are with uh, with getting you care you need. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think just we'll take one more question if it's okay with you. And it's Jeannie Smith says, could you address mask wearing for heart patients and the risks of uh, wearing them? So I would say very important wear your mask you know everybody really and and and, and um uh, one point that i think is is uh is uh you know uh, important to make is that we're wearing masks to protect others uh, largely right in part to protect ourselves but we're wearing these masks to protect others because when we breathe of course when we cough and sneeze but even talk and breathe you know it's droplets right this virus is uh, is transmitted by droplets so uh i mean i to me i i think of it you know in, in simple terms that we're wearing masks to protect each other we're washing our hands cleaning surfaces and not touching our faces which i think is so so important i think kind of a lot of times you know uh, you know falls third in the uh, in the recommendations about what we're to do and not do but very important because that's how we're going to get the virus to ourselves if we're to if we're to have it on our hands um but the mask wearing is so important uh, to protect each other, you know, ourselves to some degree, of course, but uh, it's to protect others. The mask wearing for heart patients or patients who have trouble breathing is, is a tricky one. You know, I think that it, it's uncomfortable. I mean, no doubt about it. It's uncomfortable uh, and it can be not just uncomfortable on the itchy on the face and, yeah. and feel uncomfortable, but uncomfortable to breathe. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's a challenging question. And, and I, you know, certainly if it's, if it's compromising your, uh, your comfort or it's making it uncomfortable to breathe, then, and then that, that's, uh, you know, challenging a decision. I, I would, you know, maybe easier said than done. But you know, if ask others to, you know, call in some favors, have other folks do your shopping for you, have other folks go to the pharmacy for you. Um, you know, going to, uh, you know, if you you have to as an individual go get your blood drawn or go to the doctor's office. That's you know that you can only do yourself. But you know, here we are with telehealth conversation again. If that's an option. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if it's if you're uncomfortable breathing with a mask on, uh, the answer isn't to go out without a mask. You know, it's to to find another way and to to ask for help. Uh, but that that can be a challenging one for people who are breathing trouble to begin with. Putting a mask on and trying to breathe is it's it's hard. Different kind of masks, right? I mean, there are a variety of different masks, so different thicknesses and different materials. Uh, you know, and, and by and large, they, they they you know they all do a good job of of preventing the the droplets that that is their uh, you know primary role. So, well, thank you so much. I mean, that was uh, you really clarified so many issues that people have had today. So many questions. Thank you so much, Dr. McMacken, for Thanks coming on. Taking Thanks for all that you do. All, all of these sessions, it's it's impressive. I think this is uh, in such need in our society. And I, I, you know, thank you again for for all that you're doing. Thanks for having me. But thanks for all of your all of your sessions and all your help. Uh, no, not just now, but. Uh, and we've known each other for a long time and you've helped uh, helped me help a lot of people. So I, I appreciate that. Well, you have helped me, you know, with my patients, the ones that I referred to you and everybody just thinks the world of you. I think you're a phenomenal uh, cardiologist and I always you know, recommend Dr. McMacken to everyone. <laughs> I think uh, you just have that humanity, which I think is equally important as your knowledge of cardiology and you just have a nice blend of both. So thank you very much for everything you've done for my patients and for all the patients that, you know, we have, we've had mutual patients over the years. So thank you for that. Sure. Um, 
So uh, what I'd like to also do is a big shout out to Dr. McMacken, as well as all your colleagues and all the frontline doctors out there who are putting their lives on the line, helping to, you know, with COVID patients so that the rest of us can stay home and be safe. So a big shout out to all the essential workers, as well as I just want to name, you know, the, the grocery store workers, the mail carriers, the police officers, the, the, the lab technicians, the trash collectors, the EMTs. The, I mean, I can go on and on and on, but I really, it's a huge heartfelt thank you to all of you who are just, you know, putting yourselves on the line and helping everybody else. Also, my condolences and our condolences from our group, I want to speak on behalf of everyone, goes out to all the 100,000 plus uh, families of 100,000 plus people who have died and given up their lives, you know, for uh, with COVID. It's just a human tragedy. And my heart goes out to every one of the family members left behind. And may their, may their souls of all those who have lost their lives, may their souls rest in peace. So, um, and also I just, one more shout out to all the, you know, we're living in such troubled times right now, but heart goes out to the family of George Floyd, who has started, you know, the most tragic death and my uh, sincere condolences to his family, as well as a uh, big support to all the peaceful, protesters out there who are doing their best to you know make make some transformational change that's much needed in our country so anyway thank you all for being on this uh, program tonight we're not going to have time for a guided meditation that we're uh, beyond time today but we will do that again next week and thank you all for showing up today and taking time out of your schedules to be here with us i really appreciate it and thank you again dr mcmacken for coming on today Take care, everybody. See you next Wednesday.